Pastor Kalia Fischetes. I greet you all in that wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's an honor, it's a privilege to be here. Thank you for, for being here yourselves this morning. Amen. Yes, I am from an organization called Open Doors International. We are interdenominational, um, which means that whoever or if there's anyone that loves God and is prepared to suffer for him, Jesus Christ we help them. We wouldn't go to them and say, but where are you from? Which church? Okay, we don't help those. No, we help whoever is prepared to suffer for the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we are actually in many countries, about 70 countries across the world. We um, are an undercover organization, like Pastor said. So if you like James Bond movies and and you, you actually fascinated with spy business, that's what we do. We undercover, and I hope we will find some Bible smugglers in this church one day, because that's what I pray for, especially amongst the young people, and I see there are quite a few young people here this morning. So what we do is we go into those countries undercover, we work with churches, for example, your church, There'll be only a few people would know that we actually um, partnering with them. It will be the pastor and a few members because, you know, there are sp other spies everywhere. The enemy is lurking everywhere. You know, he's like a roaring lion just watching. And so we will partner with that church. And if the pastor tells us who is suffering or where the dangers are, then we work through the church and we assist those believers we don't have a nice big board to say open doors. Now, our head office in South Africa is in Randburg. And as I said, we don't have a board. We only have the sign of the fish. And if you understand where the sign of the fish comes from, you would understand why it is also our sign. In the past, many years ago, when believers were um, persecuted, and they were unsure who they're meeting, whether it's an enemy or whether it's another believer. They will stand with the other person and they will make the sign of the fish half, the sign of the fish with the foot, and the other person will complete it. And when they do that, they will know, no, that's a brother. Okay? But of course, Satan is clever and they discovered the secrets or at the sign or the language of the under of the believers. Okay, and then they started tricking the Christians and then also began to persecute them even more. But um, how, how Open Doors started was actually through Brother Andrew. Are there anyone who knows Brother Andrew? He's called God Smuggler. Okay, there are a few people, even some people who've met him, eh? Now, Brother Andrew was a young Dutchman, and the Lord spoke to him in one of the communist countries. And the Lord said to him, Strengthen that that is about to die, that, that that's remaining from Revelation 3 verse 2. And what he understood was that the Lord said to him, he must smuggle Bibles into communist Russia and the satellite countries. And he was faithful. And he began to do that. And 70 years later, we are still doing that. Thank God there are many, many people, even today, smuggling Bibles into communist countries. And you know, we have, of course, technology, but many countries still need the physical Bible in their language. And so there are faithful people still doing that today. But before I continue, I'd like us to watch a video of Brother Andrew, and I would like him to tell you how it all began. Thank you. So, Brother Andrew passed away two years ago at the age of 94. But when he used to be stopped at the borders with his um, car packed out with Bibles, he would pray and he would say, Lord Jesus, when you were on earth, you made blind eyes see. Now I pray that you will make seeing eyes blind. And the Lord did. And he went through with those Bibles over and over and over again. Amen. And that is the faithfulness of God. 
Yeah, as a Dutchman, he was not rich. He didn't have education. He didn't even have matric. Came from a very poor background. The Lord gave him a command. And he said, yes, Lord. How? And the Lord can also give us a job. Like Pastor said, who he's been preaching on now, going out into the harvest. We can also just say, yes, Lord, how? And the Lord will equip us and allow us to do what he has called us to do. Amen. There are many foreigners in our country with other religions. Do we approach them, share the gospel with them so that they can take it back to their country? We don't even have to go to their country because they yeah, can share the love of Jesus with them. There are not many faiths in this world whose base is, and foundation is based on love. Our faith is based on love. Imagine the impact that that will make. How their lives will be transformed when they know that there is a savior that truly loves them. That they don't have to work for that. That they can just give over to him and allow the Holy Spirit to transform and change their lives. The harvest is right here. And so with open doors also, that uh, video was made in 2014. In that video, it says that 100 million Christians are being persecuted. From 2014 up till now, that number has increased. It is 365 million Christians persecuted for their faith currently. That is about one in seven believers. It is very difficult for Christians to even go to church. This morning, we know church started at half past eight. We came to church and look at how beautiful we all look and how we could rejoice in the Lord. We could lift our hands and our voices in worship. It's not like that for many Christians in the world. On a Sunday morning, if they want to have church, it will be or in somebody's flat or shack or house or a forest or a rundown building. Wherever it's safe, they would go there. And then somebody has to start, stand guard. This morning we had to lock the doors because of crime. There somebody has to watch for spies who would come and arrest them or kill them if they are found to worship. And then they would come in their normal clothes, they won't dress up. And they won't have Bibles. And then they will worship the Lord. But you know how they will sing? They will whisper their songs. Imagine this morning we're whispering our worship and our praise to this great King, this Lord that we love so deeply. And after that, the pastor will come and he will open the Bible to preach. And somebody, maybe the old lady, will open a Bible like this and she'll stand like this. You know why she stands like that? So that the people who are standing behind her can also read from this one Bible. Then they will take this Bible and they'll take it apart. They'll give that brother revelations, that sister Matthew, that sister John, that one revelations. And they'll take that and they'll read that one book. They'll almost memorize that book because they don't know when they're going to read that book of the Bible again. And when they meet, which could not be the next Sunday, they would hope that they would meet the next Sunday. If it is safe enough, they will exchange the books again and see who gets which book. They treasure the Bible so much. And like us with all the many Bibles in our homes that's collecting dust, yet we know that the Bible is the word of God. What, does, what do we re see on the media? We see so many things on the media. Do we ever compare with what the word says? It is so convincing what they say. The proof is in our faces all the time. But when we truly read the word of God and we compare that, does it align? What has final authority in our lives? Isn't it supposed to be the word of God? Hey? But we don't know the difference anymore. Because so often we take it for granted that we have a Bible, but we don't read it. But when we go into the persecuted churches, we understand. That's where we even learn how precious the word of God is. They will pay a car's money for a Bible, even today. So open doors, 
does many things. As you know, we smuggle Bibles to the countries. We also help with aid. If there's a disaster in, say, an Islamic country, they will give all the Muslims food. They will exclude the Christians. That's where open doors come and then give aid, food, medication, whatever is needed to that family or to that group of people. Uh, example is Turkey that had that huge earthquake two years ago. Yeah, that's at least we could come in and assist um, uh, believers. That's what we do. Another thing is we travel. We go and we visit the persecuted family. So if, if you ever plan on traveling to the persecuted countries, please travel with us. You will still have a holiday. You'll have a fun time. If we go to Egypt, you will see the pyramids. But after you look at the pyramids, we'll go via, 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 and we visit our brothers and our sisters in the underground. Do you know what it means for a persecuted person to be visited by a brother from a different country? It means the whole world to them. Because remember, in our country, Christians are the majority. In those countries, it's the minority. The persecutors make Christians feel as if nobody cares for them. Nobody loves them. They even tell them what God you believe in. You believe in three gods because they do not understand the Trinity. And they will mock Christians and say, God doesn't even love you. See how you have to turn your other cheek like a fool. They take whatever snippets they know about the Bible and they will throw it into the believer's face. Now remember living like, like that day in, day out. But when we go and we visit them and we say to them, the churches in South Africa are praying for you. It means the whole world to them. Their eyes well up with tears and they would say, really, do they know about us? And we say, yes, they know about you. They pray for you. That's why our motto at Open Doors is never alone because persecuted Christians feel alone. The enemy, Satan, makes them feel alone as if nobody cares. So when you want to travel, please come. You'll have your holiday, but it will be the most meaningful holiday that, you, that you've ever experienced when you go and visit them. It means so much to them. Um, at Open Doors, we, as I said, we, we send Bibles, we visit. Our pastors in South Africa go to Bible school. In many countries, remember, there's no Bible school. There is no pastor that's trained. So some of our pastors go there, and for a three-week training in a secluded area, they train them like a, a crash course. They give them that course. But thank God for the Holy Spirit, eh? how he brings that word across and make it a part of them. So maybe one day we can steal your pastor too and send him to some country to go do some training. Hey, but he may not come back. He may not come back. There's no guarantee. That's the risk. So um, Open Doors does a lot of research on persecution. We do research on countries that's been persecuted the most, we do research on the type of persecution, whether it's from government, whether it's from the community, whether it's from individuals, and then we post what we call the World Watch List. Then we uh, group 50 of the most persecuted countries together from one to 50. And today I'm gonna show you a video of the first, for, uh, the 10, for most persecuted countries in the world. And I would like you to notice on which continent most of those countries are. So if you can just put that video up, please. So which continent? Where do we see the f a great number of persecution? Africa, our continent. In Somalia, on the east, we have Al-Shabaab killing the Christians. On the west, in Nigeria, we have Boko Haram, all from ISIS, 
lines of ISIS, killing the Christians, especially in northern Nigeria. Christian girls are being abducted, married off to old Muslim men, and forced to be converted. Then we go, we look at Afghanistan, which is number 10. There, our brothers and sisters are so deep underground that we as open doors can't even have contact with them because they will be killed on the spot. In Afghanistan, they don't even acknowledge Christianity. If some, a Christian dies, they will still bury them the Islamic way. Imagine witnessing your brother and sister being buried in Islamic way. It is just so sad for the family. Um, then we go, of course, Pakistan, blasphemy. You can just say one thing about Islam and it's seen as blasphemy and people are being killed. Eritrea, small country, supposed to be a Christian country, but their people are put in um, con on containers, very high temperatures, they can't breathe. They have to lift each other up because there's a vent in the roof just to get some air. And the worst place on earth to be a Christian is North Korea. In North Korea, the Un family is seen as the gods. Children are taught to thank the Un family even when they eat, like when we say grace. When there's a fire, the portraits of the, Kun, uh, of the Un family gets removed first. If that house burns down and that port those portraits burn down and the family are outside, they get killed. Christians are taken to labor camps where they, where they stay there for years and years. There's not enough food or medication or anything. But thank God we have a way in smuggling in medication and food for them and we try and smuggle them out. We cannot even visit our brothers and sisters in North Korea. But what we do, we do go to North Korea. We have prayer prayer walks. We walk around those cities and we just pray over them. From space, a satellite image of the world shows North Korea as completely black. It's dark. It's dark physically and it is dark spiritually. So North Korea needs prayer. A parent cannot tell his child that they are Christians because children talk. They'll talk about church and Jesus and the whole family will be taken to a labor camp. In North Korea, the children, Christian children are orphaned. They are called the wandering swallows of North Korea. Nobody's allowed to feed them. The parents are taken to the labor camps. But the Bible says, if we love father, mother, brother, sister, husband, anything more than we love God, we're not worthy. God is very serious about our relationship with him. We cannot put God second or third or fourth. He has to be first. And God is not unfair because he put us first. He gave up his son for us. He made that sacrifice. He already lived that example. And we can just follow that too. I mean, and so this morning we know that persecution will come to our country too. In the year 2050, Islam will be the most prominent kind of religion in the world. They are the fastest growing religion in the world. And, Islam, and, and persecution will come to our country. Are we prepared? Are we ready to stand for our faith? Can we go to Revelation 12 verse 17 quickly, please? I'm just going to explain some of the scriptures very briefly. I'm going to start from verse 1, but I urge you to go and read it. We don't have the time to read through it. But it speaks about a great sign that appeared in heaven. And there was a woman that was clothed with a sun, and she was pregnant. It goes on. And um, there was a big dragon in verse 3 that appeared. And this dragon wanted to steal this woman's baby. As soon as it was born, 
verse 7. But then there was a great war in heaven, and Michael and the angels fought against the dragon. And they overcame him, and they kicked the dragon out of heaven, and he went with a third of his angels. They also got kicked out. And the word continues just um, to say that, verse 13, when the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. And the, verse 14, the woman was given two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to a place prepared for her in the wilderness. And there she was taken care of. And again, verse 15, the mouth of the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away with a torrent. But the earth helped the woman. It swallowed up the water. What this scripture is all about is about the church. This woman represents the universal church. The church that's been there from the beginning. The church of God. This church is under threat. From the very beginning, when the woman gave birth to the child, which is Jesus, the devil wanted to kill Jesus through Herod and through all those things that we read in the New Testament. But this church existed way before the New Testament, from the time of the Israelites, when the Lord chose his church and his people. And as we continue to read, we see how he pursued the church. In the New Testament, in Acts, especially Acts 12, we see how the Christians were persecuted for their faith and they were spread out across the earth. They had to flee from Rome and where they were based, Jerusalem and everywhere. And Satan pursued them and they suffered terrible deaths. And through all the ages, Christians were persecuted continuously, sometimes more than other times, even today. And the Bible says that persecution will not stop, it will continue. So today, we don't ask you to start pray for persecution to stop, it won't but to pray for those who are being persecuted to stand in the face of persecution, for God to strengthen them, for God to help them, for God to be with them, for the Holy Spirit to guide them in wisdom and in faith to stand for their faith. And we see that. But the Lord promises that the earth helped the woman. It swallowed up the tax of the devil. Look at the torrent, a river for a woman to swallow. So Satan doesn't play with the church. His attack is great. Sometimes even from within a church, we see that so often. And we also see how the God gave the woman wings like a great eagle so she can escape from his grasp. The Lord will give us, the church, a way to escape. Remember 1 Corinthians 12, 26 says, if one part of the body suffer, the whole body suffers. Our brothers and our sisters are suffering. If they suffer, we suffer. So when they suffer, what do we do? We cannot be there and help them, but we can be here and we can pray for them. There is such power in prayer, and we know that because we wouldn't be here if we didn't believe in the power of prayer. Amen. That is our greatest weapon. It's our sword, the Bible says. We kill the enemy with our sword. Our fight is not spiritual. It's not physical. It's spiritual. So when we pray for our brothers and sisters here, the Lord strengthens them. And so this morning, our, our request from Open Doors is, where we speak on behalf of the persecuted, uh, Proverbs 31 verse 8. It is that we pray for them. When you ev whenever we ask a persecuted person, what can we do for you? They always say, eight out of ten times, and we've done research on this too, eh? it says, pray for me, sister. They don't, they're not like us South Africans that ask for money all the time. They ask for prayer. Pray for me, sister. This morning, I ask you on behalf of them to pray for them. And so we read verse 17, um, Revelation 12, 17, the last scripture. 
Sorry, I'm jumping all over the place. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman. The dragon was enraged at the church and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring, you and I. And who are this offspring besides you and I? All humans? No. Those who keep the commands and hold fast a testimony about Jesus. What are the commands of God? To love God with all our hearts, all our minds, all our souls. And to keep the testimony. What is your personal testimony about Jesus? The day you got saved. When you gave your life, your heart to him. Those are the children of God. They are the remnant, the leftovers, the little bits that the Lord would come for, the bride of Christ, those that hold fast to their testimony and to his commandments. This morning, are we truly the remnant? The devil is not worried about the rest. He's worried about the remnant. He's worried about the offspring of the woman the small group. And so this morning, let us ensure that we are part of that remnant. And we know, the Bible says, whoever lives righteously will be persecuted. You will be persecuted, even in this country, maybe in your own circumstances. But let us remember our brothers and our sisters and begin to pray for them. And we can do that. We have a prayer calendar um, that we Get, that gets sent to us every third month. And on there, we have prayer requests for every day. We have a country and a specific person. Now, we all have needs here. Imagine thousands of people pray for our needs. Won't that be awesome? Think about the impact that it will make. So let us pray for a specific person in a specific country. I normally just print mine and keep it in my Bible. If I have my quiet time, then I can read. It takes a minute just to read the situation or about the person. You can stick it at the, on the door behind your bathroom as well. Eh? It takes like a minute to just pray there too. Anyway, as long as you pray. And just pray for them. Let us all unite our hearts and pray for the persecuted church and the family. And then we have um, our newsletter, which is free of charge as well. So you... You can read all the information that I've given you this morning about persecution. You can just read that. It's not fake news. That is the real, it's real news. It's really like that. If they tell you there's so many people killed in that country yesterday, then that's the truth. We only release what really happens. And so this morning, church, um, as I experience the presence of the Holy Spirit during our worship, I want to say to you, are at the right place. You really are. And continue to serve God with all your heart. Put him first in your life. And remember that we have brothers and sisters who really need your prayer. And continue to pray for them. Um, after the service, I will be at the back. And if you can just fill in a form, I'll give you a pen. And there's a condition with that pen. Every time you use it, you have to pray for the persecuted church. Otherwise, you can't have a pen. Okay. God bless you, and thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you, Pastor. I appreciate this.